Hello and welcome to WCAT TV and radio. I'm Kiki Latimer. I'm your host for the Catholic Bookworm. And we have with us today a um, wonderful writer, author, professor. Uh, is it Dr. Paul Gondro? Yes, correct? that's right. <laughs> Doctor, I wasn't sure. Um, from Providence College. Um, and I, I'm going to have him tell us a little bit about himself. But Paul, could you start us off with a prayer to begin with? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank in the name you. of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for gathering us together. We pray that you guide our conversation. We pray that your wisdom always lead us. We pray especially that in our actions we may give glory to you and to your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. So Paul has um, been involved with the uh, compilation of two different books connected. Um, Clerical Sexual Misconduct, Volume 1, in which he wrote an amazing chapter 17, which is on the maleness of Christ. And then um, the same authors, editors, Jane Aldolfi and Robert Fastigi, have just put together um, a second compilation of essays, um, again, on clerical sexual misconduct. Um, the first was more um, connected um, with the abuse of, of men in the church, boys and men in the church. And the second one is more focused, I believe, on women. Um, I haven't read the second one, except for Paul's um, contribution to it, which we'll be discussing today. But the second one is called A Foundational Conversation. Um, so, oh, you have it. Wonderful. I have the PDF on my computer. Yeah. Do you have a copy of the first one? As I well? do, yeah. Here's the, here's the volume one. Okay. Good covers. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you can judge a book by its cover, <laughs> <laughs> it's a dark topic. It's a difficult topic, yeah. very yeah. painful topic for many of us, um, even those who are not. Um, directly affected by it. So many people have been indirectly affected by it. And then, um, which I found out I was indirectly affected by it about a year ago um, with a priest that I, I loved dearly as a teenager. Um, and then people have just been indirectly, indirectly affected by it, just by the painfulness of what the church has gone through um, with the scandal. Um, so, Paul, maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you wound up <laughs> in these two volumes. Yeah. So I uh, did my doctoral dissertation a long, long time ago now, 25 years ago, <clears throat> on Christ's human passions, on his full humanity. And that has uh, that has broadened into further, more properly anthropological research and study on really, uh, I could put it this way, the meaning and purpose of human sexuality. Um, what, what God intends for us by creating us sexually different, male and female, men and women, uh, and how that's inscribed in our bodies and thus is identified with our personal identity. So just uh, so I, I published a lot on just that that score alone and, and preparing a book on that topic. I call it a comprehensive account of the meaning and purpose of human sexuality for, from the perspective, especially of the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. That's really my my area of research, the thought of St. Thomas. And then applying that specifically to Christ and to Christ's humanity, how, how that bears on the fact that Christ was fully human, that he was a man, and uh, that with reference to these two, with these two um, volumes on clerical sexual misconduct, the relevance is kind of obvious there, you know, that Jesus was a man, you know, so he was himself endowed with a male sexed nature. And... Uh, so he, um, he uh, uh, you know, um, uh, comported himself, morally speaking, uh, both res with respect to the same sex and with the opposite sex in a perfectly moral <laughs> manner and a, in a perfectly sinless manner. So 
Um, so I was asked to focus on that and to hold up the example of Christ as the antidote to this grave scandal and to the model for men in the priesthood. Really, really, the 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 essay is targeted for uh, for those who are ordained. You know, for 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 their their Jesus's maleness, his perfect chaste example, as a model for them, and and uh, their. Uh, in their priesthood and you know and in, in, in particular how their their effective relationships their emotional relationships uh both with respect to men and women so so it's not just accidental that christ is a male good question <laughs> um you know, the Christian tradition has always had a difficult time affirming Christ's full humanity. We have preferred to kind of leave it in the abstract. He became a man <laughs> and not really press it further, not push it further. Um, but, you know, the, in fact, you know, what the, really, really the very first heresy that the church encountered was a heresy denying his full humanity. It was not his divinity. It was his full humanity. The heresy is called docetism, and it comes from the Greek word, which means to appear. That, you know, they, really the, the subtext behind it is a disdain for, ultimately for material reality, for embodied reality. We can't have God <laughs> joining himself to that. We can't have God uh, becoming that. So he only appeared to be human. Uh, it is unbefitting. Uh, of God's of God's nature of God's holiness to have him uh, joined to a body a material body especially and this was this goes back so early that even the uh, New Testament is responding to it uh, Saint John in particular the the great prologue to Saint John verse fourteen <laughs> the prologue and the word became flesh you know and he he could have said the word became man but he says flesh just to really to drive home the 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 stuff of this of of this world that that the son of god took on and not just accidentally like i'm wearing this jacket but it's a substantial union so that the son of god is now eternally human and he doesn't he doesn't doesn't lose his humanity once he ascends to to the father in heaven uh saint paul also was responding to this heresy of docetism Okay, so I, I, uh, so to reflect on Christ's maleness is to affirm that and to push that, uh, a, a little further even that it's, it's to recognize that, that God made us male and female. And so our sexual identity is no more accidental to us than our biological makeup. And we know that sex sexual difference is owing to us first and foremost because of the biological design by which god created us so that we as human persons uh we as 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 individuals are thus we are we're composed of constituted by our body and our soul we are and so we identify with ourselves ourselves with our bodies and our soul and our bodies are by their very design male or female so that kiki you're a woman and you know you can no longer speak of yourself as a person without referring to yourself without understanding yourself as a woman than i can as a, as a man and so it is for jesus you know to affirm the reality of the incarnation is to affirm that he must be either a man or a woman. And of course, the 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 historical evidence, the, the scriptural evidence is clear that he was a man and not a woman, which is not to say anything negative of women by any stretch. It's just it's it's only to affirm his full humanity, because to be fully human, one must be uh, a man or a woman. And that that sexual identity then becomes uh, essential to one identity so he was a man and this uh, to appreciate the sort of the the um the biological depth of this is uh, you know he, he so he had uh, the 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 bone and muscular structure proper to a, to a man uh 
he had, you know, he had the XY chromosomal complement, the karyotype of XY, which was itself the biological cause of, of his primary sexual characteristics. So, yes, he had a male reproductive organ. He had he had bone and muscle structure proper to men. But he also had, um, he had a, a, a neurobiological design to his brain. Recent research has shown that male brains and female brains are de designed a little differently. For the sake of complementarity, I mean, the beauty is the complementarity of male and female. Male, um, male and female. He created them. Genesis one twenty eight. It it goes much further than just you know the sort of cosmetic exterior. It it reaches into the very structure and design of the brain and the emission of neurotransmitters. So men and women, you know, they 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 uh, exhibit. Uh, um, male characteristic behavior in the case of men and female characteristic behavior in the case of women. That would have all been the case for Jesus as well. Well, you know, we're in a society, a couple of things came to mind as you were speaking. One is that we're, of course, in a society, um, first of all, that has this whole gender confusion that we're dealing with right now. But even before that, we have a society that thinks of spirituality as being very non-fleshy. You know, everyone will become an angel when they die sort of ideas, um, and, and the idea that spirituality, um, religion, is to get away from the body. Um, and of course, John Paul II was certainly trying to counteract those concepts with his theology of the body, um, which is, you know, which is brilliant. Um, but just now, you also mentioned this complementarity of male and female, which is one of the things I, I wanted to ask you more about, um, which because I, I don't know that you mentioned it as much in the two um, essays, but this sense of, you know, male being directed towards the female and the female being directed towards the male. Um, we obviously, with the, a huge amount of the sexual misconduct, um, we've had males directed to males rather than to females, which I find fascinating. Um, that you know that there's a problem there to begin with that is brought out in the first the first volume of this of this problem um, that that complementarity that complementarity isn't there. Um, recently, I remember hearing someone say, "If a man can't be married, if a man is not capable of marriage, then he shouldn't be ordained." Um, which is an interesting that the, the the flip side between you know the celibate priesthood and marriage is is very close. They're two sides of the same mm. coin. Yeah, yeah. You know, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth had some very profound things to say about this, uh, in that he was reflecting on celibacy. That celibacy is a sacrifice, and it's a sacrifice to God only if one. Uh, appreciates recognizing that one what is offering to god namely marriage with a woman is good right. <laughs> and right. this is, can't sacrifice it that's right yeah you know and this becomes problematic then in the case of of men who experience homosexual tendencies and desires um they don't have an inclination a proper properly ordered inclination to marriage so choosing celibacy by default it's not it's not a sacrificial offering anymore in fact to speak of John Paul II's theology of the body, he saw celibacy as, in fact, a kind of marriage, that the nuptial meaning of the body, the spousal meaning of the human body, is exhibited in celibacy on a spiritual level, not on a fleshly level. In that, what he meant was, instead of being joined to a woman in the flesh for life, a priest marries God's people in the spirit. And so, as a man commits himself to his wife, so does the priest commit himself to the church as Christ was, the, the bridegroom of the church. So, all that imagery of bride and bridegroom, uh, the church, the bride, Christ, the bridegroom, that all carries over to the priesthood. Uh, in, in as much as the priest, as a sort of alter Christus, another Christ, uh, embodies in himself the role of bridegroom of the church. And um, so... You know this. Um, um, yeah, the, can I can I just say one more thing about the complementarity, Kiki? That um, one thing I love to stress is that you know we are we are men and women um, first and foremost because we have bodies and our bodies are are of an animal like design. 
Okay. So you got an animal body, you got a sex body, either male or female, for the purpose of procreation. But we're not just animals, <laughs> we're rational animals. And uh, we're ordered to interpersonal love, especially on account of our rational souls by which we are made in the image and likeness of God. So this image, you know, it, it exists in a male and a female body. So sex is transformed. It doesn't lose what it what it otherwise the meaning it has on on that animal level. And so that's why the ordering to procreation, which it obviously is what it's for, if you just look at it in terms of pure biology. Uh, but the you know the church's moral teaching on human sexuality recognizes that if sex is ordered to procreation by virtue of of the biological structuring. So also is it ordered to what we call unit of love, to in interpersonal love. And the way we see that exhibited in a sort of marvelous way is the, um, is the form, the physical form of, of sexual union of, of man and woman, husband and wife, which is unique among the animal kingdom. And that is face to face. So what you were Talking saying about man, this the other day for man that this is and what is that that this is more than just a physical encounter yes it's it's a joint of bodies but but it is also a joining of souls of two persons who love each other and that face to face embodies it expresses that physically speaking in a, in a profound way and that's that becomes in fact the model that the that Saint Paul likes to use uh, turns to in 1 Corinthians 13 for our seeing God uh, for their beatific vision, face to face. So it's beautiful. So we have this, this historical fact and, and our tradition as well of Jesus as a man, as a male individual. Um, and I know at one point you talk about the fact that, you know, we're trying to, you know, we've lost, in our culture has lost a sense of what it means to be a man. You know, everybody, men now are this, this wimpy. Yeah you know, view of men, um, very disrespectful view of, of, of men at this point in our culture. Um, but so you talk about, you know, wanting to get back to a traditional view of men. And I understand what you mean by that in the sense of, you know, with respect and honor, men with courage, men capable of leadership in a good sense. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, for some cultures, though, the traditional view of men is not a good view. It's, you know, men who own women, men who dominate women, men who can divorce a woman, men who can, you know, a very machismo view of men. And so I, I certainly know when you say traditional view of men and brothers and sons that you're not referring to that, um, that, that in a sense, Christ is breaking with that traditional bad view as well um but he's also you bring out a lot especially in the second um chapter that you wrote that he's also breaking with traditional views of women very clearly um that women are not to be abused women are to be respected um <laughs> at the same time i had to laugh because at one point in you know i know you're very much a, a lover of thomas aquinas as am i um but there is a, at least one or two points in the summa where thomas refers to women children and idiots um <laughs> are all kind of grouped together which um you know in our summa theologica group we've had a we've had a good time joking about over the years um, I torment the guys with that line every so often. Yeah. So how does Jesus break both the traditional bad views of, of what it means to be a man or, and, and how does he also break traditional views of how women are to be treated? Yeah. So you're right, Kiki, to say that really, uh, not only are the cultures, but for the history of humanity, going back to the fall, going back yeah. to, to the, the one of the consequences of sin is that is that women, Genesis makes this very clear, Genesis 3 makes this very clear, that, that women now are susceptible to male exploitation. And we have witnessed that, you know, up and down the centuries. And that remains very much the case in certain cultures today. On the other hand, our culture, uh, our, our, you know, um, sort of uh, post-feminist culture, however you want to call it, 
has gone to the other extreme. Now we, we hear language of toxic masculinity and that, that men can't embrace their proper male identity, that, that it's, it's toxic uh, in and of itself. So uh, that's, but that's, that's, that's as unhealthy as the machismo extreme. Right. And uh, so you're right to lay your finger on in Jesus we, we, you know, in Jesus, we, we, we got the proper calibration. We see, um, we, we see exactly how men and women are, um, are intended in their standing towards each other and towards God by God, by virtue of God's creation. Okay. So when we look at Jesus, now that was a culture where women were very much second class citizens, despite, I mean, the oddity here is despite the fact that the creation account makes it very clear that men and women are equal and a bone of my bones flesh of my flesh you know the same thomas aquinas affirms that that the highest of human friendship is enjoyed by man and woman and wife and friendship presupposes equality saint thomas and saint bonaventure love the image of eve being created from the rib of adam not from his head, not from something lower, but from his side to show that to to show that woman stands next to man as his equal. Okay. Uh, despite that, in the Judaism of the first century, uh, w women were um, were very much uh, relegated to a second class, second tier social status. We know this from. Uh, we just know, well, we know it, for, we see it in the in the witness of the New Testament. But also, I like to turn to the evidence that we can find in the Talmud. The Talmud is that, it's that, um, it's a, it's, um, it's commentary, uh, biblical commentary on the Torah by various rabbis. Goes back to the second century, so it gives us a very good snapshot into the Judaism of Jesus's day, and in particular how women were regarded. So there, the Talmud uh, makes it very clear that women were unfit to study the Torah, and that their role was to support their husbands and their sons studying of the Torah. The Torah being the first five books, the, well, the Law of Moses, as contained especially in the first five books of the Bible that women were looked upon as a kind of sexual temptation. And so they had to stand apart in synagogue. They had to stand behind a wall. And in the Jewish temple in uh, Jerusalem, there was they were confined to the outer court. They had to cover themselves, especially their heads, because they were regarded as a sexual temptation. And that um, the, the, there is a, a Hebrew word called Nagaya. Nagaya refers to the various Jewish laws that regulated very strict public interaction and private interaction between men and women. Sure. So that men were not to uh, were not really to interact with women in public, uh, certainly not uh, one on one. Uh, and really, it was allowed only between men and women in marriage and they're in the privacy of their home. Okay, so along comes Jesus, right? And so you uh, see before in the Talmud this very external, um, trying yeah. to set up, you know, a fence around everybody. This this, this external, um, keeping everybody safe through externals. Yeah, and of that's, course, that's Jesus deep. comes along and says, "Well." What about having internals, you know, yeah. so that you don't need right, yeah. so many externals um, moving to yeah, this? So, yeah, so, yeah, at, at first sight, it's kind of quizzical because the purpose of the Nagaya, these very strict external laws regulating interaction between men and women, it had sexual propriety as its goal. And protection. Uh, yeah, really, protection. you know, protection for women as much as men, but especially women, you know, since they were susceptible to male exploitation. So Jesus comes along and he allows women to travel with him. He accepts women as disciples. So they are fit to be taught by the rabbi, Jesus in this case. And um, he talks to women in private. You know, we just had where we just had the third Sunday of Lent this past Sunday. The gospel reading was the encounter uh, between Jesus and the uh, Samaritan woman at the well. And he speaks to her in private. And, you know, the, the, the passage in John mentions when the apostles rejoin him, they're amazed at the fact that he's speaking alone to a, a woman. Amazed, what it means is, is really 
what are you doing? <laughs> you know, this is this is kind of scandalous. So now, you know, so what what is he doing? Well, what he clearly is not doing is throwing sexual propriety, sexual purity to the wind. You know, we in fact, if if uh, if the if the 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 um, moral standard of the Old Testament was really among other things defined by its rigors with respect to sexual purity, especially if you compare Jewish culture to Gentile culture, Roman Greco-Roman culture. Jesus even elevates that. So he he condemns lustful desires with the very jolting, arresting phrase of adultery of the heart. He revokes the mosaic permission for divorce by uh, and and which was a male right. It was not a female right. Men could divorce their wives. Women could not. So by doing away with that, not only is he affirming the indissolubility of marriage, but he's affirming the equality of women and men, husbands and wives. That men, you can't treat your women like your property. They are your they are your equals. So. Uh, so what you mentioned is it's the external versus the internal. So what Jesus imposes, or what what he what he prefers is is internal self governance, not not structures imposed from from without from these laws, but self mastery. So a sexual purity that goes from the inside out. So really what the, the the very clear message he's sending to his male disciples is men no women are not sexual temptations you men get a get control of yourselves and uh you know take responsibility for your own actions and um and and exercising that proper self mastery which we we use the term chastity to 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 denote, to denote be chaste be chaste. Uh, and so, and being chaste, then you can have, then this opens the door to interaction between men and, men and women, because it allows for a very profound personal interaction, which we see in the case of Jesus, um, interacting with women freely, going up to them, speaking to them, reaching out to them, even speaking to them in, in private. I think one of the things, though, that gets lost in this discussion just a little bit is when you have this complementarity between men and women, when men and women are, in the sense, in partnership with each other, whether they're in partnership in a spousal relationship or in friendships or co-workers, um, you know, and I understand that on one hand we say, okay, we want you to start placing the internals for men so that the fence is more internal. Um, but as, as, a, as people in partnership with each other, you bring out that obviously men are wired very differently than women, and men are much more visually aroused than women are. It's much, mm -hmm. more, it's much easier in some sense for a woman to create these internals within herself because there's not that visual stimulation in the same way there is with a man towards a woman. Um, I mean, we saw this, you know, for years, Playboy magazine, it's still going strong, probably. Playgirl magazine lasted one year. Uh, women weren't interested in seeing naked men. It didn't do anything for them. Um, so as partners, you know, we have a culture right now, the Me Too movement, and I've seen it in the feminist movement that says, you know, it should all the burden of this safety for men and women is now placed on men. Um, a woman should be able to run around naked, you know, and wearing next to nothing or nothing. And a man should just be able to control himself. And so that there's no, that partnership isn't there. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it seems to me you can't, it can't be, the burden can't all be on men or in the, in Jesus's time, the burden was all on the woman, cover yourself yeah. up, cover mm -hmm. your head stay out of our territory. The burden was all, while we have a good time, you stay home in the kitchen and we don't want to see you because you're a temptation. And now we've swung to this other side where women do whatever you want, dress however you want, be as immodest and unchaste as you want, because now it's all up to the man to control himself. Yeah. And so I'd just like you to speak to that a little yeah. bit. Oh, that's a great point, Kiki. So, yeah, lust is a is a specifically male problem. 
Okay. It's not to say that no women ever struggle with lust or that women, generally speaking, don't struggle with lust, but men struggle with it more than women do. And the, all the evidence bears this out. But what's interesting is that is, is recent research in neurobiology bears this out. That is the, it's the biology of the structure of the brain. As I mentioned at the outset of our, of our interview, that the male and female brains are structured a little differently. And this, this, uh, uh, in one of the areas in which it's structured a little differently is with respect to sexual desire and sexual pleasure. So the, the male brain is structured, is oriented in a particular way to sexual desire and to sexual pleasure. Uh, you know, not that the female brain isn't, but it's not in the same regard. The female brain, in fact, is, is, is structured more for relationship, which is why women experience greater sexual pleasure in the context of committed relationship. Whereas men are more, have struggled more with just the physical side, the raw root physical side of sexual pleasure and sexual desire. I mean, okay. there's that old saying, what is it? Men give love to get sex. Women give sex to get That's love. Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all, all the psychological research bears this out. Men are much more interested in, in casual sex than women. Uh, there are uh, uh, sexual deviancy and sexual pathologies are, are much more commonplace in men than they are in women. You know, they did this one study um, 25 years ago, and then they repeated it recently where they took uh, an attractive woman and um, she went to a uh, hundred uh, men and asked, you know, would you like to go out to dinner with me tonight? Would you like to come back to my apartment with me tonight? Would you like to have sex with me tonight? And they, and, and the flip where a man went to a hundred women. Okay. And uh, the study, it was repeated twice and the men responding, would you like to have sex with me tonight? Total stranger was, Eight out of eight, 80, eight, 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 you know, eight out of ten <laughs> women responding to "Would you like to have sex with me tonight?" Total stranger, zero, <laughs> zero. Right? Okay, so um, men have a struggle, and the what what I like to to point out is um, so the male brain has this predisposition for this, and that suffers the the effects of original sin in a particular way. Uh, we know that there was a, a disordering of sorts on account of original sin, and I, I would suggest that that includes for men in this neurobiological predisposition that men have for sexual desire and sexual pleasure, for being visually stimulated and, and to, to experience uh, physical pleasure, that that th what that means is that men are especially prone to, to lust. Okay, so this is where the example of Jesus is so crucial because he he would have had that neurobiological predisposition to physical desire and to physical pleasure, but he would not have. Um, but he would, of course, he was sinless. He did not take on the the moral consequences of original sin, so he lived with that moral disposition in a perfectly moral way, uh, and so he really becomes then the model for men. Uh, but, you know, so uh, what I liked, what you mentioned about with, with the onus is not simply on men, but it's also on women. It's important for women to realize that men are visually stimulated in a way that they aren't, that men are physically oriented to, to physical, to sexual desire and pleasure in a way that women, generally speaking, are not. So when a woman doesn't dress modestly, for instance, uh, when a woman flaunts her body, what a man sees is a body a man what what a, what what is difficult for a man not to see is an object of desire and and what is difficult for a man to see under those circumstances is a person you know the way i like to put it to my to my uh, female students is do you want men to see you as persons or do you want men to see you as bodies and uh, a man you know uh, that doesn't mean you can't dress beautifully that you can't enhance your feminine beauty but it does there is a way of enhancing in your feminine beauty but in a way that 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 is done modestly that respects modesty and then what a man is and is attracted to then is not so much a body but the feminine person the the female person that as a man he's naturally drawn to so 
it's not just a male responsibility that if if lust it's important for women to to realize that men struggle with lust more than they do and that um and so you know keep that in mind with respect to how you dress with respect to how you interact with men and what signals you can be triggering in them and and vice versa it's really a two-way street it is and in our culture it's very hard to get that message across i think that that we that we are in partnership um with one another um, in many different ways and to, and to find healthy ways um, to express sexuality in a culture that's sort of run amok sexually. Run amok. It's, it's so easy to fall off the rails to go to one extreme or the other. And, you know, we have to just keep striving to get back to the middle. And so this, this recognizes our sexual differences right down to our neurobiology with respect to the differences between sexual desire and, you know, just to sexual orientation. But, um, but yeah. I want to get back to why, because I know our time is, is limited. So we have all these wonderful priests um, trying to live a holy life, um, but they're living alone. Most of them, many of them, they're not living in community. Um, so there's, I think there's a lot of loneliness in the priesthood, the way, certainly the way it's being lived out right now in the United States. I don't know so much about other countries, but here, you know, each priest is alone in their little kingdom of the rectory. Um, they're lonely. They have computers. Um, everyone now, not just the priests, but everyone has this incredible, ac horrible, incredible, easy access to pornography. Um, how, just let's talk about that. I'll let you talk about that a little bit. You know, trying to live these, these, this virtue, trying to live virtues of chastity, holiness, courage, um, in, in a, you know, in a society that's run amok. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, um, um, yeah, the, you know, you lay your, your finger on a real heart of the problem that is, you know, with, with the dearth of vocations to the priesthood, diocesan priests can very typically today find themselves all alone in a parish. And if, so if they don't have uh, you know, a healthy outlet for their very human needs, their very human affective needs, emotional needs. You know, this this is a recipe for desire because they are human, and you know they they are sinners as much as anyone else, and they have the same moral struggles that that anyone else has. Now, if the moral duty to live to imitate Christ, to live up to the standard of Christ is um you know uh holds them to account in a particular way by virtue of the office they hold and by virtue of the fact that they do represent christ uh with respect to the church and most especially in their defining act which is to consecrate the eucharist whereby not coincidentally they identify themselves not simply with christ the person but with christ the, the man in reference to his his body, which is a male body. And that's one of the reasons, incidentally, why it's fitting that only men be priests, because they are identifying themselves with Jesus's body, and that body was a male body. Uh, okay, so they have a special duty, I would say, to to um, to imitate Christ, to to live up to the moral standard that, that Christ imposes on all of us, which we, you know, any disciple of Christ is, is bound to, um, to live I mean, up to. That's why the sex scandal has been so horrific. I mean, if you hear that a teacher or a Boy Scout leader abuses a child or, you know, is sex, there's some kind of sexual misconduct, it's one thing. But for a priest, it's a whole different thing. Because yeah. the Boy Scout leader isn't standing in place of Christ for us or the teacher. Yeah. Um, yeah. Something, you know, so much more horrible happens with yeah. clerical misconduct yeah you know there there is a really harrowing case that pope benedict the 16th mentioned in an essay on the sex abuse scandal he, he spoke of a priest who and in, in this particular instance it was a priest who abused an altar girl and at he would begin the abuse by saying to this girl this is my body which is given for you I mean, you know, how evil can it get? You how know, evil, I, I thought, you know, talk about I read that. that. 
you can't you know, it's the same can't. words that the abortion issue uses that you know satan gets right in there this is my body you can how can you you can't turn the office of the priesthood more upside down and on its head in a more grotesquely perverted way than that it's it's so that's so harrowing you know so um uh the, the really the key the key is virtue kiki the key is virtue and you know there of course it, it, virtues run the gamut because uh because there are so many areas of human life are we can't compartmentalize our moral life you know that that um you know as, as we enjoy the good of food and drink as we enjoy the good of money as we good, enjoy the good of power so we enjoy the good of sex and so we have various virtues that regulate all that but what virtue denotes is an attaining of moral excellence and of becoming the the human persons that god intended us to be and with respect to our sexual drive our sex drive and our experience of sexual pleasure god intends that area too to share in the attainment of human <laughs> flourishing of human excellence of being of, of being the sexed um persons that god intended us to be and jesus again there is the model so what this doesn't mean is that is that we we shut off our emotional lives that we isolate ourselves that's a re that is a recipe for pathology that you know that men, i think men really in seminary and in, in priestly formation uh that um the, the inculcation of moral virtue needs really to be stressed of 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 chastity and really it's, it's actually it's the virtue of virginity we don't talk about this virtue very much anymore but the virtue of virginity is the perpetual renunciation of all sexual pleasure for one's whole life because chastity actually chastity is a virtue if you think about it we don't think about it often in these terms, but it's a virtue proper to married people because it's only within marriage where sex sexual pleasure can be experienced in in a morally proper proper way i wanted to bring that up with you because i i think it's important i know what you mean by that but i think it's important to make a distinction between sexual pleasure and genital sexual pleasure because as you say we are sexual beings everything i do i do as a woman yeah. so i experience sexual pleasure as part of my being so if i go out and pick flowers that's part of being a girl you know right. That's right. um so when you talk about you know priests um and religious giving up sexual pleasure you're referring to sexual genital pleasure yeah because we right. experience pleasure you experience pleasure as a man I experience it as a woman. Jesus experienced pleasure as a man. Um, so, when you know, did you see what I'm saying? I think yeah, yeah. So, if, yeah. So, if, if you want, use the word intimacy or physical intimacy, yeah. uh, genital yeah. intimacy. Right. Um, you know, I think it's perfectly fair, incidentally, to to say that Jesus experienced sexual temptation. And what I mean by that is that he was a man, and then he, yeah. you know, that he would have wrecked of women around him but that that attraction so men just by virtue of being a man with that neurobiological wiring have has this sort of drawing towards but what that never led to was actual sexual desire because he was called to be celibate to be to be virginal and i think it's important and i i talk to especially when i'm teaching ethics with the kids the difference between a person with virtue who has temptation and a person with no virtue. So the man who has virtues and has really worked on that, yes, he knows he can go and, you know, see pornography on his, you know, his computer, it's there, but it doesn't even, he doesn't even go there. He doesn't like dwell on it. He's not stewing on it. Oh, I'd really like to do that, but I'll keep myself from it. Yeah. It's just, no. No, I, I understand that it's there. I understand it as a temptation, but it doesn't enter into my soul as opposed to, you know, there's no virtue. And so you, you can't yeah. keep yourself from pornography. Well, so this is the problem with the external constraint, you know, is that, you know, is there, there's, there's nothing internal necessarily corresponding to that. St. Thomas says, Thomas Aquinas says that in temptation, the sin enters the picture when there's internal consent. 
So it's not it's not the good being presented. Jesus was tempted. The, the gospel evidence is clear. It's it's where uh, where one begins internally to give in, and there's where virtue comes into the picture. Because when one is virtuous, one yeah. what that attains to to the very depths of the soul so that it, it keeps us in check at that internal level. It keeps us from going to where it will become sinful. And that's what it was for Jesus. And then you can see how free we become in our in, in our interactions with people of the opposite sex, with people of the same sex. We take our humanity, our male humanity, our female humanity, and all its emotional wiring and all that, and it frees us to, to be ourselves, to be human, instead of keeping us sort of hamstrung, you know, with with uh, uh, our our hands tied behind our backs because I got to be super careful, you know, I got, I, you know, I can't really speak to this woman. It's like it is again, you know, virtue is that care, very careful middle course between the two extremes. Right. We have a wonderful priest. Uh, he's quite elderly now, Father Ray Soriani, and here in Westerly, Rhode Island. And years ago, when he was younger. He would go to the beach to hear confessions on the beach. Wow. He said, if the kids won't come to me, I will go to the kids. And the kids would line up on the beach to go to confession with Father okay. Ray. Wow. And he got some grief about it. Um, there were some other religious people who felt like a priest has no business being on a bikini clad beach. And he said, bikinis are not my problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah. um, he said, I don't. And it, for a number of years, he heard confessions on the beach. And I always thought it was beautiful that yeah. he would do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it, it would be then no more inappropriate for any any moral man to be on a beach if, if that were the case, you know. But but uh, how how is your how is the exercise of your custody of the eyes? You know that I'm a, okay. I like the beach. I like to go to the beach. <laughs> I have to exercise custody of of my eyes as much as as much as anyone else, and I do. <laughs> you know, you and I at, do. You have to work at virtue, you right? You do. You know, and and for me, the the you know the ocean is 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 uh, is beautiful and in an astounding way i'll just you know let me look at the ocean right now you know? <laughs> keep my eyes on the ocean <laughs> <laughs> well i really thank you i know uh, we had some technical difficulties that we started with that cut us a little bit short here this morning um i think both of these books are really exciting i think your contributions to them are are wonderful um is there anything else that we've missed that you would really like to squeeze in here in the last couple of minutes? Uh, just that that Jesus provides the antidote to today's, um, you know, to to the both to the extreme of the machismo extreme, but also to the toxic masculinity extreme. That um, that Jesus provides the reset for men to um you know to to become the kind of man that god has intended us to be not to renounce our masculinity but to embrace it and in jesus we see a man who fully embraced his masculinity and and thus lived it in a way that god intended he was the protector he was the provider and uh how affirming he was of the of the women around him and by the way the 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 apostles you know i, I don't want to I shortchange them and their example because they they're you know the council of trent calls the apostles the free the the first priests of the new covenant they were ordained at the last supper and that they um their first reaction was would have been typical of any you know jewish male which is what are you doing with women jesus we that's the evidence in john's gospel with the encounter of the woman at the well you know they're they're kind of they're astounded but they quickly got with the program. They very obviously quickly got with the program and recognized that, that the way of Christian discipleship is a, Pope Benedict calls it, the mysterious new way. And that, that regards men and their, and their treatment of women, how they look upon women. So as much as Jesus is an example of men in the priesthood, so are the apostles. It freed as much as the virtue of chastity freed Jesus into his, in his interactions with, with women, people of the opposite sex, with men, people of the same sex. So, uh, so are the apostles, uh, moral examples for men in the priesthood. And their successors in the priesthood would do well to imitate them as much as they imitate Christ. 
Well, we certainly need to pray for our priests. They're, uh, they're carrying out their duties in a very difficult society, a very difficult culture. So we pray for our priests. Amen. And our religious, and we Amen. pray for vocations. Could you end us with a prayer? Absolutely. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for our priests. We pray that you send workers into the vineyard. We pray that you send men who embrace the call to imitate Christ, who embrace the call to live holy lives, who can then be models for all Christian men and women that we too, following their example, will embrace the call to holiness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, I know you're teaching at uh, Providence College still, correct? Still and, teaching at uh, Providence College. That's a great privilege to be reaching out to, to young people today. Yeah, um, to yeah to <laughs> try to <laughs> deliver this message to, <laughs> to 18 to 22 year olds is it's not easy i love the challenge though you know i i love the challenge but it's i i you know i have to strategize that's for sure <laughs> for sure yeah well, god bless you <laughs> yeah i call it i call it academic evangelization you know <laughs> I'm trying to evangelize but in an academic way right right yeah. Well, God bless you, and thank, thank you for you. being with me today here on the Catholic Bookworm, and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch. It was a pleasure to be with you, Kiki. Thank you, Paul. God bless. You too.